there's not a lot of churches that have the courage to listen to me twice. So, uh, so uh, kudos for that one. Um, <laughs> and uh, Leonard Raven, you know, one of my favorite uh, preachers to listen to when I feel like this. I need to be rebuked, which is often. He said, there's three kinds of churches in my life. He said, those that have me the first time and clap for me and then clap when I'm gone. Those that have me back a second time and then don't clap for me when I'm gone. He said, and then the third kind are the kind that they're saved. And they don't ever want me to leave. <laughs> so, um, if y'all don't know me, my name is Michael Stringer. I've been here once before. Uh, to my everlasting shame, my legacy here will be that I was late the first time I was here for the first time in 28 years of preaching. And uh, anyway, now that we got that repentance out of the way a second time, um, does everybody have a sheet now? They're pretty fast. Um, you know, I was, uh, last night, I was, uh, I was on my laptop, and I was about to hit enter to, uh, to print y'all's sermon, and the Lord was like, no, no, that's 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 not that's not how we need to go. Let's let's go a different direction. I was like, well, you could have told me this Tuesday or Wednesday, Lord. <laughs> you know. So about nine thirty last night, the Lord decided to to spill His heart, and boy, am I glad that He did. And uh, and so I think this is really a sermon kind of for the generation. I think it's kind of a sermon that the whole world needs to hear right now. And um, if you look what was going on in Israel at the time, it's a, a little mirror, a reflection of what's happening here. I mean, the people had grown complacent. They had grown comfortable. They uh, cried when their AC went out. They, uh, they cried when they didn't get uh, meat instead of just bread or whatever you want to say. They, they, they were a bunch of whiny babies. Um, oh, by the way, I, I, I'm already into my sermon stuff. I'm into lead with this. Y'all are, did I hear that y'all are having a woman's shooting day? Did I hear that? <laughs> this is a bad idea. <laughs> respect of him in every way because I know who he is and what he can do. And 
I've seen it, and she gets up there and ting, 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 ting. And I'm, I'm standing over here, I'm like, what in the world is going on here? And they get a club of 13 shots. 13, I can't, even, I can't even get this out. 13 shots, he scares me so much. 13 shots, I think she missed one. And the Lord spoke to me real clear and said, well, if you ever wondered, you know, about leaving. <laughs> that thought is dead and gone. <laughs> but if you can't laugh at church, you need to go home, amen. But anyway, I had to get that story out of the way because that is a true story. There's no preacher as well in that over-exaggeration. That really happened. So I look forward to y'all going and having fun. Ezekiel 37, the Israelites had grown complacent. They had grown comfortable. They, uh, they the say in today's church were the kind of church that would go on Sunday mornings and hug everybody and pat everybody on the back and and say, I love you so much, and I'm praying for you. And then they would go home and not really think another thing about God until the next Sunday. And um, and they and they were okay with that. And that is precisely where we are in America today. Precisely. Even though as we talked about last time I was here, even though people are three times more likely to receive Christ right now than they were before the pandemic, we sit in our houses and in our offices and in our churches and we do nothing. We do nothing. Let me tell you something, church, God hates it. And, um, and so let's get into this. And uh, I did bring my watch today, so I think we got to be out of here by 11, right? We'll shoot for that, but I can't promise anything. It says on your sheets, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He set me down. He didn't take him to a mountaintop. Surprise, surprise. He didn't take him and put him somewhere with a view and say enjoy the view and, and just have fun while you're up here. No, he took him by the Spirit and he drove him into the valley. To the valley. And while he was there, he sees all these bones on the ground. Now, for a prophet, it's not just the physicality of the bones on the ground. For a prophet, when you see bones and you have spiritual discernment, you know that that means death, despair, a lack of nourishment, a lack of replenishment, hopelessness. I think is the best word. But hopelessness, despair, apathy. And then, as a prophet, when you see bones, you think about finality. Why? It's bones. Ain't, ain't nobody coming back from bones. I mean, if you got a body, at least you got something to work with. At least you got something to work with. Um, and so the Spirit of the Lord drives him to the valley. He sets him down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And so I just want y'all to imagine this valley just full, chock full of dry despair. And uh, in verse 2 says, And he caused me to pass among them round about. 
And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. There were very many. The word for dry is the Hebrew word yabesh. Look at your neighbor and say yabesh. Y'all can do better than that. Look at your neighbor and say yabesh. And it means to be dried up, lacking any type of moisture, refreshment, or renewal. The, the word literally means that you look at it and you, you kind of think to yourself that powder is just going to rise up off of it. It's that dry. Y'all ever been outside and, and it hasn't rained in a long time? You take a step and then the, the ground just comes up slightly the dust. Or maybe you drop something on the ground and that's heavy and a bunch of dust does what? It just disperses. This was like that. It was that dry. And so you, you keep going here in verse 3 says, And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, only thou knowest. Can these bones live? live? This is a question that every single struggling person, moreover, every single struggling church has to answer. Y'all have a big undertaking right now that you're a part of and you may not even know it. You're shepherdless. And so that means that if you didn't have a prayer life beforehand, you don't get a pass to not have one now. Yeah. Like, you can't be like, well, I'm just going to wait until we get our next pastor to get right. Or I'm just going to wait until we get our next pastor to, to come faithfully and tithe faithfully. More than ever before in the history of your life, your church needs you right now. Amen. And they need you to pray. Amen. My dad's been on at least two, if not three, search committees. And I'm talking about not, not that the size of the church is all important, but I'm talking about at big churches where there's pressures that you can't even imagine. You know, $5 million budgets and stuff like that. I mean, he's been a part of those of those committees in, in these massive churches. And I watched, it was unique as a young preacher. I watched him walk through these things. And, and I didn't see my dad cry a lot in, in my life, but I remember one, one night, I remember seeing him at the table and I came downstairs. He had just had tears rolling down his face. And so I, I walked behind, I said, Lord, you know, am I supposed to even go up there? Am I supposed to say anything? And what, what he's praying, it was late. It was late into the night. And he was just at the table praying. He had his Bible open. He had some notes over here. And he was just writing fevers. And so I went up behind him. And I kissed him on the back of the head. And I just prayed for him. Because see, when people are doing war... With the Lord at their side, you can't try to intervene and save them. The Lord has to get them through that. Also, Chambers says that God doesn't give us discernment so that we can criticize or intervene. He gives us discernment so that we can intercede. Some of us need to get a lot better at that. We try to intervene and God wants us to intercede. Well, he was, he was at that table, and, and later, after, after they, you know, they come before the church, and, and I was going to that church at the time, and, and, and preaching on the weekends, but I was still going, and a faithful member of that church, and later I said to him, what was going on that night? And he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I remember that, he said, we were, we were, we had two people in mind. And they were both exactly equally qualified on paper. And he said, I was begging God, how do we know? How do we know? 
And he said, about that time, I felt somebody praying for me, like in the spirit, you know. And, and I said, well, well, so what happened, Dad? Like, like how did you know? He said, when, when we got on the phone with both people, I'd ask the Lord to have one of the guys just say any word that was on my sheet. And there was a lot of words on my sheets. He said, just any word, just anything. He said, I knew that God would do it. And uh, my dad's favorite verse is, the eye is not seen. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, they are in the heard, nor they are in the heart of man. Things God has prepared for those who love him. And, and uh, he said he got on the phone with the guy, and, and sure enough, he, he, he just brings up the very verse that dad had studied. They said that they had another call with the other guy. And dad just kept praying and praying and praying and praying. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they just, I mean, like, he just knew. It was like, it's almost like meeting your wife now, you know. Just knew. And, uh, and that guy served that church faithfully forever and a day. He was a great, great pastor. But when, when you look at this, it says, can these bones live? This is, this is a question y'all have to ask right now. Like, like the pastor, the next pastor that you call shouldn't have to get here and completely rebuild the church. It should already be on fire for him when he gets here, so he just got to carry the torch. Yeah. You know? He shouldn't have to come and, estab and establish some visitation program because y'all were too lazy to do it before he got here. Now listen. Can't say amen right there and say oh me. Can't say oh me, say ouch. Can't say ouch and say oh my. Say something right there. Don't leave me up here hanging. <laughs> Y'all invited me. <laughs> Can these bones live? If you have not figured this out for you lately, and you didn't figure this out lately, let me help you because it's going to be the only prophecy thing that I say today probably. Let me help you see the future. It's not going to get any better. Israel's being attacked from all sides. There are wars all over the globe and rumors of wars. Russia, my guys in Africa and shoulder to shoulder are telling me that they are seeing Russians on a weekly basis. They haven't seen them in 30 years. Russia is trying to get a foothold in Africa because they know that they can traffic arms from there. China, I've got guys in China that are running for their life right now as we sit in this air conditioning. They're in a tunnel in the back of some concrete place or underground and sitting along something that's literally this wide so that people can't find them, so that they can preach to each village in a church of over one and a half million just in one village. And yet... As we sit here, the question is, can these dry bones live here? Can they live? And we ain't running from nobody or nothing. And we won't even get up and, and go to our neighbor that we're supposed to be loving as ourselves. that's going straight to hell when you leave here today if Jesus comes back at midnight tonight. And we won't even go to them and just, hey, I know this is crazy. You may not even like cookies. But here you go. I just, I just want to tell you, God loves you so much. He has a plan for your life, plans to give you hope and prosper in the future. And no matter what's happening in your life, no matter what's happening between you and your relationship, God, I just want to tell you, he loves you. I love you, and I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again three days later, so you don't have to live in misery and fear. Amen. So I don't have the gift of evangelism. Well, that's awesome. I don't either. 
And yet everybody I pray with lately at every restaurant breaks down like they've never heard the gospel before. Y'all want to hear a fascinating stat? If you drove more than a mile today, here in Shreveport, Louisiana, in the literal middle of the Bible Belt, if you drove more than a mile, you passed at least one person who has never in their life heard a clear presentation of the gospel. That's right. Can these bones live? Listen, I, man, I, if I didn't love y'all, I would have stayed up all night and changed the message. I would have gone to sleep. Got my sleep. Got up. I went to bed at 4.30 last night so I could make sure y'all had sheets that were worthy of this message. I don't want a medal for that. I just want you to recognize that God has a plan for this church. And this message is not a hard one like I'm throwing it at you. It's a message because I love you. And when the next guy gets here, I want you to be ready to hold his arms up like Aaron did Moses. Let me tell you something. I've been doing this for 28 years now. I have never listened to me. I hope you everybody look at me right now because I want to make sure you hear. You don't remember anything else I say. I hope you remember this thing. I have never seen pastors drop like they are right now. Amen. Right. Never. 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 Not even close. Let me give you. This is for free this morning. I'm going to get back to this. I graduated from seminary with about 25 guys that I was really, really close to. Okay, I, I, I was on a, a football team down there, and we had our whole football team, and we won the championship while we were there, played basketball while we were there, and, and, and all this stuff. And so I made all these relationships, and you go through seminary, it is like the cemetery. It, it, will either, it will either refine you and make you like Jesus or it will put you in the grave. I mean, Laurie and I, we, we wept when we were in center night after night. Some of our friends that had just gotten married in the last two or three years getting divorced, they couldn't, they couldn't handle the attacks. So why are you telling us this? Because I want you to understand that the shepherds right now in the church need sheepdogs. They need sheepdogs. They need, I've got a dog at home. His name's Bear. His name's Bear. I rescued him when he was five weeks old. That dog will not let anything come near me. Nothing. Not a wasp. Not a horse fly. Not a snake, a five foot long snake was in our backyard the other day. He picked it up and threw it like 30 feet. Scared me half to death. I think I screamed like a little girl. He threw it right at me. I'm like, you're supposed to kill it. Don't throw it at me. If it's on the ground, I can handle it. Don't throw it at me. We need some bears for, for some shepherds. Amen. Of the 25 guys I went to seminary left, Three of us are st still in, in full-time ministry. Three of us. Three. Now, let me put that in perspective for you. I went to seminary for 111 hours. I will say that to impress you. I have the equivalency of two secular doctrines in hours. Okay? Most of us did that. To make between forty and seventy-five thousand dollars a year. I mean, why are you telling us this? Because y'all have to answer this question today. You can't wait. Can these bones live? So let's look at what that looks like. So man, can these bones live? You keep going here, and and, and he says only. Thou knowest. Can these bones live? How, does, how do bones come back to life? It has to be Christ above all, above our jobs, above our sports, above our hobbies, above hunting season, dear God help us. Above our opinions of what we think is okay. It, it, it has to be Christ above all. And when something comes in direct conflict, 
conflict with his word, we choose Christ. Not 50% of the time, not 75% of the time, 100% of the time. When we don't, we repent. We say, I'm sorry, and I'll do better. He answers with, oh, Lord God, only thou knowest. And he literally acknowledges the Lord's omniscience, his all-knowingness. And then, and then, again, the Lord said that to Ezekiel, prophesy over these bones. And say to them, O travels, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the Lord, word of the Lord. What did he tell him to prophesy? He heard him, he, he heard him say, prophesy, hear the word of the Lord. Now listen, I, I don't know if any of y'all got this, but I saw more false prophecies about Trump becoming president than anything else I've ever seen. Now, I wish that that Sometimes, I, I, I gotta be careful how I say this, my wife's gonna be mad. I, sometimes I wish that we were in the Old Testament times just so people had to be uh, a little more careful when they call themselves on TV apostles and prophets and they send all these new letters to you and they're like, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet. And then they predict that Trump was gonna get put back in the White House in, in the first you know, 30 days or whatever it was. And then, and then they, they prophesied this. And then nothing happened and all this stuff. In the Old Testament, those people would have been brought out in the middle of the street and stoned. But these people that sent all this stuff out to people who were just trying to have hope, they still have their million-dollar houses and their $100,000 cars. So what I'm saying is be careful who you listen to this morning. You know, be careful who you listen to. Make sure you know their backstory. Y'all know what I'm saying? Amen. Make sure you know their backstory. Most, most of those TV evangelists are, you got to be super, super, super careful. But anyway, so can these both live Christ above all? Only, that knows, what does he tell them to prophesy? The word of the Lord. The word, he tells them to prophesy the word. And then, after he says, um, prophesy these bones to say to them, O travelers, hear the word of the Lord. And in verse 5, he says, Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life, and I will put sinews on you, and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you. That's the second time he said that, that you may come alive second time, and you will know that I am the Lord. In verse 5, he says, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. They can't do it. In John 15, 1 through 5, it says basically, let me sum it up for you, it's been a lot of time to go there. If a man is in me and I in him, he abides in me, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, he will do nothing. Listen, this church can hire the greatest preacher in America. But if it's not in Jesus, if it's not in the power of the Spirit, He'll sit up here and preach every Sunday and this altar will remain empty. Because it can't just be him praying. It can't just be him preaching. It can't just be him witnessing. We've gotten so far from what God intended for the shepherd. God intended the shepherd to preach. To preach the word. That's, that's what he's supposed to do. But today, the pastorate is filled with so many different things that the guy, the last thing on his list for most pastors is actually creating the sermon. That has to be first. If you're on the search committee in here today, ask him, where does that rank on your list? If he says it's not first, throw him out. And wait until you find somebody that says that's first on their list. Visiting hospitals, that's great. He's got deacons that are supposed to be doing that. I'm not saying I don't do that as a pastor. I'm not even pastoring a church right now, and I do that all the time. Matter of fact, when the pandemic came and there were no pastors in hospitals, Laurie Tate, I was up there all the time. I'm not scared to die from some of what? To be absent of life, to be present with the Lord. You 
that he's going to protect you, and he is who he says he is, or he's not. If you're on the search committee, make sure you ask him that. Where do you put sermon preparation on your list of things to do for the week? If you don't say it in numero uno, be careful. Amen? Amen. All right, so anyway, that's for free. So anyway, so he says, so, so, so you keep going here, and he says, I, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will cause breath to enter you may come to life. They can't do it. You can't conjure it up. In, in England, a long time ago, when you know how they knew, you know, we advertised, it's so funny here. In America, we advertise revivals. We, we actually advertise revivals. We're like, we're having revival at so-and-so church, North Kiefer Baptist Church. We're having it on this day. I'll never forget when I was studying revivals in seminary, <laughs> became a big passion for me. And so about the time I went, and this church was, they were advertising revival and I went, I just thought it was so funny, you know, for three days this guy preached his heart out and he could tell that no one had prayed because no one came to the altar at all and it was a pretty big church. So you could tell that he was prepared, but the church wasn't. In England, they did it in the reverse. In England, they only put stuff on the lamp posts. They would put paper on the lamp posts and write, we're having revival. Like, we're in the middle of revival. So you need to come to North Kingfield this Sunday because we're in the middle of revival. We're in the middle of it. We're not, we're not planning for it on June 29th. I mean, like we're right in the middle, smack that middle of it. You, you keep going here. He says, I will cause my breath to enter you that you may come to life. We can't do it on our own. It takes Jesus. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes every single person in here getting in the Word every single day. Last time I was here, I talked about the invisible hour. There's not one person in here who should operate on 24 hours a day. There's not. You operate on 23. You take, like, shoulder to shoulder is what we teach. You take, the, you take the first hour of the day and you yank it out. That's God's. Period. You just yank it out. You give that to him so that you can make it through the rest of the day. Amen? Well, so he says, I will cause the breath to enter you that you may come to life. They can't do it. And then for the second time, he says, I will put breath in you. Why does he tell them that? So you may come alive and have a personal knowledge of the literal greatness of God in verse 6. And then in verse 7, he says, So I prophesied as I was commanded. As I prophesied, there was a noise and a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin, skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. There was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. John Mott wrote, wrote these words, A necessary precursor of any great spiritual awakening is a spirit of deep humiliation growing out of consciousness of sin and fresh revelation of the holiness and power and the glory of God. Let me tell you what this means. The things that you used to be able to watch on TV, you can't watch anymore. I cannot begin to share with you. I don't have time up here to share with you the amount of shows that Laura and I have started watching and I had to stop watching in the second or third episode. They start out great. And then by the second or third episode, they, they're already headlong into the gay or lesbian agenda or, or whatever agenda you want to put out there. Critical race theory. It's a necessary precursor of any great spiritual awakening is, is saying that I've got to depend completely on God and that I need a fresh revelation of His holiness and power and glory in my life. Well, then, we, as we see the sinew in the flesh and the skin covered them, but listen, in this statement, watch this, but there was no breath. There was no breath. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. 
prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus saith the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came back to life, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, behold, they say our bones are dried up, and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your grave. Whew. I will open your graves. I'll get to that statement here in just a second. I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you to the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, and I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I alone have done it, declares the Lord. He says that, 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 that it comes from the four winds, that here comes the spirit, and the breath of God comes from the four winds, the north, south, east, and west. Let me tell you something this morning. You can run from God, but he has a scapegoat. He is escapable. Did y'all see this? In, a, in a, this week, in, in what I believe was God being completely humorous with us as Americans, there was a guy who was swimming, and um, there's been a big push lately in theological circles to disavow the book of Jonah because it's false. Because there's no way that anybody could live in a well for any amount of time. Well, guess what happened this week? <laughs> now, I'm talking about the Southern Methodist Convention is coming. And so there's all this stuff getting voted on, critical race theory. I've already talked to a whole bunch of people. It's going to get destroyed like it should. And, and all of a sudden, so this, there's all these people talking about, the, the, you know, this book of Jonah, it can't be real. And, you know, and, and so, you know, we just need to stop preaching the book of Jonah and all this stuff. And, and let me tell you something. The word is inerrant. Amen. It is without error. I have studied it. I have studied it in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, which, by the way, is a pain in the hind. Okay? It is hard. Okay? Laura used to see me and come in, and I would have no cards that she helped me make. 100 to 150 deep all around me just praying that somehow by the osmosis of God it would make it into my brain. <laughs> True story. When I passed that class in seminary, my my he, my uh, uh, Aramaic teacher was this little bitty lady. She was the only one who had the grasp on this certain subject to teach it. And she literally, you know, all my all other teachers were, were guys. But, but she was standing there, she's a little little bitty lady. And when I passed the class, I couldn't believe that I passed. I mean, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, I, I, I barely left my room for nine weeks. And literally, and so I grabbed her and picked her up. Before I even know, she told me, I said, how did I do? She said, oh, you did well. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> yeah. And before I even knew what was going on in my head, I picked her up, spun her around, and put her back down. And she looked at me like, Jerry, this is a Southern Baptist institution. <laughs> and when I saw her face, I was like, oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Can I just pick you up and spin you around? I'm sorry. It wasn't like a dance move. I was just celebrating, and I don't even know what to say right now. Just get out. And I was like, and the next, the next time I saw her, she was like, I understand. Because I was like freaking out about it. She was like, I understand. You were just excited. I was like, yes, ma'am. She's like, you just about broke my ribs. And I was like, I was just excited. But listen, but when the four winds come, there's excitement. And and so there's this guy this weekend, he gets swallowed by a whale. No joke. Gets swallowed by a whale. And listen, here's the best part. Nobody can say he didn't. Because his buddy was like, yeah, the dude got swallowed by a whale. Calls 911 or something like that, or the Coast Guard, or whoever it was. They can't find this guy. Well, guess who pops up later? This dude. And he's like, I don't know what to tell y'all. I'm in the well. It's dark. I'm thinking I'm done for. I'm finished. And he said, and then all of a 
sudden he said, I just kept kind of trying to hit it. It wasn't very much room, but I just kept trying to hit it. And all of a sudden, he said, I, I just got spit out. I called my buddy, he was going to the men convention, and I was like, hey, yo, you see this story? Mm -hmm. You know, make sure somebody reads this from the podium. Okay. <laughs> tell, them I, I tell them I sent it to you. The word is without error. And when the four winds come and the breath of God comes into something, people can't knock it anymore. You want to be revolutionary as a teenager in here? You want to be a true rebel? A true rebel. I'm not talking about like follow the crowd, rebel, and go drink and smoke and have sex before marriage and all this kind of stuff and, and just bow to peer pressure. I'm talking, you want to be a true rebel? You want to be a Christ follower? You want to be a disciple and God bless your life? People used to make fun of Tim Tebow for waiting till marriage to have sex. Well, guess what? He, he just married a supermodel. Make fun of him now. Signed an NFL contract with his old coach. You can't make these stories up. Only God can do that. He's 30 years old or something like that. Amen. Right. I told the boys, I was like, if he actually makes that team, it means so much to me that he was faithful. Guess what? Me, who is somewhat famous in preaching circles, is going to drive 800 miles to see this dude play with my sons. I will... Get I will give, what do they call that stuff, uh, appointments or whatever, for as long as I have to give it to be able to afford all that. I'm trying to tell you, that's how, that's how I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there somehow. It's not in the budget is what I'm saying. Amen? <laughs> and so sin and flesh and skin covered them, and there was no breath. i got to hurry. I'm out of time. And so the Spirit of God comes from the four winds. The breath of God comes from the four winds. North, south, east, and west. You cannot escape Him in here today. You cannot run from Him. You cannot disappear from Him. You can't go into the closet with your computer or laptop or phone and hide from Him what you think you can hide from Him. 82% of all men in the church are viewing porn at least once a week. What? What? Why? You might as well invite Satan into your life, give him a key to your brain. And by the way, just while we're here, when you look at porn, did you know this, man or woman? It literally, this is a true story. Look this up if you don't believe me, but be careful. Uh, you know, um, it literally rewires your brain. And study after study after study after study after study has linked it with Alzheimer's. Did you know that? When you view something that God did not intend for your life, there are consequences that you can't even see or think about. Right. That's why he tells you to stay away from that trash. That's somebody's sister. That's somebody's daughter. Come from the four winds. And they came to life and they stood on their feet. Everybody stand up real quick. Everybody stand up real quick. Y'all were just now going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> they came to life and they stood on their feet. Look beside you. Look beside you. Go ahead. Take a good long hard look. Turn around and look behind you. This is God's army to revive the city, this state, this nation, your school. And, and if you look at my favorite verse, yeah, I'm going to make y'all stand up for the story. <laughs> Because I had to lay down for it. I'm in the hospital. I'm in a hospital bed. I'm wondering, am I ever going to see again? A couple of days before, I've been hit with a golf club. 105 miles to the side of my face, a driver. 460 cc's of titanium. And, it, and, and I hear the nurse say at the golf course, I don't think he's going to make it. I heard her say that out loud. I'm in the hospital bed, and, and I'll wake up from surgery a couple of weeks later, and I have a covenant with all my guys and shoulder to shoulder about discipleship ministry, and I'm going to get the word every day. And, and my wife looks at me, and she says, is there anything I can do for you? I said, I don't, I don't know. Can you read? 
it to me. She says, where do you want to go? And I was like, Zephaniah. She was like, Zephaniah? I was like, it's just what came to mind. She reads the first chapter, and I'm like, man, I'm regretting this decision already. Second chapter, I'm like, gosh, I need to repent of some things. Third chapter, first verse, second verse, third verse, fourth verse, fifth verse. I'm like, oh, dear Jesus, this is getting worse and worse. And then the ninth verse comes. And for, for all these years, my discipleship ministry had re remained nameless because I refused to call it Michael E. Stringer Ministries. And then, and then this verse came. And, and, and it says this. It says... Well, i got to turn my sheet over because I'm too emotional and I'm not even going to remember what it says. It says, For then I will give to the people's purified lips that all them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him what? Shoulder to shoulder. And I looked at her and I said, Read that again. Y'all may be seated. I said, Read that again. Shoulder to shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder. And she said, Yes, that's the name of my discipleship ministry. And if I had to go through all of this and have my face operated on it, Get screws put right here and right here and right here and right here and a uh, titanium plate right here. I, I would do it all over again just so I can hear you read those verses too. The people besides you are the people who will battle for you. Battle for you. In verse 11, they say, we're tired, we're dried up, God can't do anything here, we're too small, we're too comfortable. Dietrich Bonhoeffer read the cost of discipleship, and in it he said, only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient truly believes. If there is something in your life that you're being disobedient in today, then guess what? It's robbing you of the power of, the power of God in your life. Charles Finney said a revival is nothing else than a new beginning of everybody in that place being completely obedient to God. Tozer wrote, have you noticed how much praying for revival has been going on of late and how little revival has resulted? I believe the problem is that we have been trying to substitute praying for obeying. That's good. We've been trying to substitute praying for obeying, and it simply will not work. God says in this passage, I am the God of resurrection. Believe the hype. I'm here. I'm real. I'm reviving. I'm pouring out my spirit. And this is how you're going to know that I'm the Lord. I'm going to open up graves and rise all of you up. It gets better. You will come back to my, by my spirit that I will put in you. And then I lift a bunch of I list a bunch of scriptures that y'all can take home with you today and read in your quiet time. And in 2 Timothy 1 8 through 10 it says this, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner, but join with me in serving for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to what we have done in our words, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is granted in Christ Jesus for all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ to what? Who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He robbed you of your grave clothes. Amen. You can't put them on if you want to. Because when you die, he snatches you up and you're instantaneously with him. What is dead in you this morning? Is it service? Did you serve for a long time and you got burned out because you were relying more on yourself and serving than you were on being filled with the Spirit on a daily basis? Is it sanctification? Is it sacrifice? Is it a part of your heart that's dead? Did a relationship die and, and, and you feel like part of your heart's gone? Is your respect for your husband or wife gone? Have you had a hard time since the pandemic? You know, we had a lot of relationships. People like just kind of met each other in the night where they had just been, you know, coming and going. And then all of a sudden they got to stay home for three or four weeks together and get to know each other again. It wasn't pretty for a while. Like I'll tell you, my phone was blowing up. People were like, man, I, I don't even know this person anymore. You, have you lost your love for your neighbor? Have you lost your passion for the lost? Have you lost an obsessive passion to see Jesus Christ move on this earth right now? 
When people look at you, what do they see? Do they see the gospel walking? Do they see Jesus? Do they see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? What needs to come back in your life in you this morning? What needs to come back to life? Leonard Ravenhill, one of my favorite revivalists, said this. You never have to advertise a fire. I can tell you that's true. 2009, I'm on the phone with my wife, and I get off, and I'm rounding a corner coming home from work, and and I see all this smoke, and I see this ambulance almost hits me, cuts me off going into my neighborhood, and I say, hey, man, I'm going to let you go. I'm, uh, I'm going to go pray for these people, and, and sure enough, I pull up, and it's my house on fire. 3,900 square feet going in 30 minutes down to the ground. Lost everything on me. Everything. A couple of months before that, Hurricane Ike had come through and dropped two trees that were about 200 years old on my house. My whole house had to be rebuilt. It had just been redone. While that happened, the guy who came to replace my my back sliding door glass was like, hey, Michael, I, I know y'all play. Like, you have to pull out here. He said, hey, this, this sliding glass door, it's, it's, this glass is acrylic, but I can, I mean, it's glass, but I can make it out of this acrylic that's like bulletproof. I was like, bro, I don't need that. He's like, yeah, but it's only 100 bucks. Your insurance is paying for it. Why not? I was like, well, hey, let's go. That day, and I'm telling y'all, when I tell y'all I complained to the Lord about that hurricane in my house, I did. I complained. I was like, we just painted. We just did this, Lord. Now I got to deal with all the insurance companies. And there's two trees on my house and my roof is destroyed. Listen to me this morning. When my grill blew up, the propane tank came shot out of the grill. Um, I know this is going to take some imagining, so y'all forgive me. But imagine that this is the corner of that sunroom and that this right here is the glass door and that this right here is my grill and the propane tank blew straight into the glass door. That's Michael. That's Hope. And that's Tyler. You see, folks, Hurricane Ike doesn't destroy my house and the glass doesn't get replaced and the propane tank that blows up and sends shrapnel and this propane tank into the glass. If I doesn't hit my house and the glass doesn't get replaced, I don't have three kids sitting here today. And you think God doesn't have purpose for your life? You think that God doesn't have purpose for your suffering today? lost your mind? For every tear, for every single tear, he catches himself. He doesn't send an angel. So Revelation says, hear me, every tear you've ever cried, he doesn't send an angel. He comes himself with a bowl and he catches them. And then he counts them. He counts them. And one day, one day, when we stand before him, do you know what he's going to do? Once we pass the great white throne judgment and then the beam of seat of Christ where his eyes of fire work out our works and they burn up to, to see what was of chaff and then what was of him. And then we stand before him either naked and we made it or clothed with righteousness by what we did while we were here. Then right after that, I believe, he's going to bring a ball. And I believe with all my heart, this part's not in the scriptures. But I believe with all of my heart that he's going to take that bowl and wash our feet with our own tears. Mm -hmm. Now we know he catches them. We know he counts them. We don't know what he's going to do with them. But that's what I believe. Don't you ever let Satan sell you the bill that you're alone. That you cry alone and you grieve alone. Amen? Amen. Well, I, don't, I can't give an invitation because I, I'm, I'm 15 minutes.
it's over. But I tell you what, I'm going to stick around for a while afterwards. If you want to pray with me, I'll be right here for a little while. I know y'all got to go to Sunday school, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be right here for a little while. And I'll be up here if you want to pray with me, if you want me to just pray over your marriage or pray pray for you in, in some area of your life, a prayer player, a blessing over you, I'm going to be right here. All right? Would you pray with me and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for this church. Thank you for their courage to have me back. Thank you for your word. It's been spoken clearly here this morning, God. Would you just bless it and pour out your favor and mercy on it, God? Would you show us how much you love us this morning, that you can, that you alone can take what's dry and withered, and, and you can bring it back to life by putting your breath on it, by putting your spirit in it. We know that Isaiah 40 and the 8th verse says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Psalms 119 says, Your word, O Lord, is settled in heaven forever. First Peter 4, 11 says, If we're going to walk, let us walk as Jesus. If we're going to talk, let us talk as though we're the very oracle of God. Lord, let your breath fill us. For this church, I pray that you would bring them the, the, the most godly, most wonderful, the best pastor that they've ever had. And I pray that they would be worthy of the man that you're bringing them in the sense that they prayed for him, that they'll lift him up, that they'll support him. Even when he steps on their toes, they'll love him through it. In the name and the authority of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. You're dismissed. I love you so much. Go to Sunday school.